Matteo Bellucci, Chief Executive of Anobi, welcome to the London Book Fair podcast. Uh, congratulations on the Sainsbury's investment. Uh, how did it come about? Tell us a bit, a bit more about it. Well, basically, um, Anobi was a startup created in July 2010 with backing from HMV, which at the time owned Waterstones, and three publishers, Penguin, Random House, and HarperCollins. So what happened is that then subsequently in May 2011, uh, HMV sold Waterstones. So essentially the, the reason to back an hobby ceased because you know, not having any interest in books anymore, they didn't see any strategic reason to carry on investing. Mm -hmm. So we spent a few months looking for the ideal partner for an hobby to replace HMV. And Sainsbury was probably the natural choice considering that we wanted somebody based in the UK with a big customer base who already bought books. So that narrows it down quite a, quite a lot. And uh, so we engaged with Sainsbury a few months ago and they are building their online entertainment quite aggressively. And books, e-books was one of the things they were not covering yet. So they, uh, they saw the opportunity to fast track, sort of leapfrog mm -hmm. their e-book offering by picking up the HMV stake. Uh, I think most people know that Anobi comes from the Latin for bookworm, but explain a bit more about the origins of Anobi as a company uh, and the aims of Anobi Books and your vision for it. So there's two companies in reality, because there's the old Anobi, as we call it, and the new Anobi. So it's like a, a, a snake that dropped the skin. Uh, so the old Anobi was created by a very smart guy in Hong Kong called Greg Sung, who in 2006, which just to give you an idea, is at the same time when Facebook was created, saw the opportunity to create a social network for book lovers. So we got together a couple of guys and they started building um, the platform. And the platform then became quite successful in places like Italy, in Spain, in Taiwan and Hong Kong. Um, then two, two years ago we created this new company and um, um, with the aim of becoming the first social retailer for ebooks in the UK. We wanted to have something where the focus was 50% on social and 50% on retail. The social retail idea is rooted in uh, the desire to do something different from the competitors. And the thing we identified that none of the other book sites really has managed to, to achieve is uh, provide a satisfactory um, discovery solution. Explain how readers can join the Adobe community, because it is a community, isn't it? Uh, and which devices can they use it on? All of reading devices? The offering is multi-platform, like uh, any credible offering these days in, uh, in the digital world. So we have obviously a website, but the architecture of the system is designed around uh, an API, which is essentially an engine that manages data around people and books. And we don't have a device, but we provide the whole uh, find, buy and read experience on mobile and desktops. You can then buy in the eBooks because we built an entire e-commerce system mm -hmm to um, allow users to buy the ebooks and the system is cloud-based which means that once you buy the ebook your ebook lives in the cloud but then these books can be downloaded to any device including other readers like the Kobo reader or the Sony reader so we're also of that school of thought that you should own the ebook you purchased which means you should be able to download them put them on a USB stick and throw them in a drawer for posterity now, I was gratified to log on today and not to be greeted, first of all, by uh, a trilogy of erotica titles, but some wonderful category selections, uh, what to read after Harry Potter, books to make you think, the great books of the last 10 years, some fabulous uh, ideas. It's sort of Wikipedia meets Facebook. One could create one's own categories, I presume, and then have a sort of dialogue uh, with, other, with other users and readers, is that right? Yes, there are a lot of those elements and the book club idea is very interesting and it's something that we're looking at probably developing even further. But the, we think that this topic structure which is curated, developed by the community themselves is uh, it really plays to the natural way that we use to discover books. Because we choose books based on a number of very complex uh, uh, conditions. And that's why we actually don't believe that algorithmically you can recommend a book. It's very difficult to say, well, because you read these books, then you should read this other book. Um, there's too many books and there's too many situations that you're in. You really don't know what you're thinking right now. You Maybe you just split up with your partner yesterday. How do we know that? And so creating themes, we think, is a much easier way for people to navigate books. 
that's a unique thing. It's never been done this way. You can find lists on Amazon and on places like Goodreads, but they are, um, they are side services. They're not at the core of the navigation. Um, this is a way also to find people, as you said, because what's interesting about books is that we think that the social value of books is extremely high compared to other things. Mm. So it's something that people really like to talk about books more than most things. And so what's very important when you talk about books and social is not only to point people to books, but also to point people to other people. You can think of an obvious, a three-dimensional environment where you can navigate following any of three dimensions. And these dimensions are people, other people, books, and categories. And every element is linked to the other two at any one time. So you can find the book and then see who has the book, what they think of it, and then from there click through and see what other books they have. Or you can see in which topics and categories that book sits, which allows you to give immediate context to the type of book. Because if it's a book about sisters or a book about, you know, made them make you think, it tells you a lot more than the description at the back, in just in a glimpse. So from there you can jump into another category and say, well, you know, this is not the right book, but I like that category, let me go in and see other books about it. And then from a category itself, you can discover books or similar categories and see also the people that follow the category. So if you see, it's, it's a three-dimensional intertwined space where from every point in this three-dimensional space, you can go in any direction. You recently set out your stall to independent booksellers. Some might say, but these guys are working with Sainsbury's. What, what's in it for us to go with Adobe? What would you say to them? Well, what I would say is that uh, they haven't got much choice because they either go with somebody backed by Sainsbury or they go with Amazon or they go with Kobo that is backed by Rakuten, which is the... Amazon version in Japan. So, you know, at, unfortunately, at the end of the day, providing ebooks in a professional, seamless way to users is a big guy's game. The key is to make sure that you retain the relationship with the customer. So, that's what we offer. So, our offering to independent booksellers is that if they want to sell ebooks over the counter, we share the data with them so they right. can maintain that one on one relationship with the customer. Right. And more importantly, we've come up with a mechanism that, as far as we know, nobody has to allow them to actually sell the ebook at the point of sale instantaneously. You're on record as saying DRO will go, not if, but when, uh, and that the bad guys will always exist, and that DRM protects no one and punishes the law abiding. Uh, do you think there is a case, though, for better educating the public about intellectual property rights? There is, a, and, and, and it's a very good point you make, because DRM and protection of intellectual property, they're two different problems. They don't actually have anything to do with each other. There is a misconception that DRM protects IP, but it doesn't, because the people that don't want to uh, pay for that book, and hence they are not interested in the value of that IP, do not use DRM. They rip it off straight away. So the problem is that you end up having the DRM only being used by the honest guys who bought the book. And you know, if people go around stealing, uh, you know, cars, you don't go around punishing the good guys that are just, you know, not stealing cars. You take the bad guys and you put them in jail. And DRM is penalizing the market, is holding the market back because the ebook with DRM is an inferior product to the ebook without DRM. You know, if you had an ebook without DRM, there'd be more people buying them and using them. What's your best guesstimate as to where DRM will go and how quickly the market will grow when it does? So I think it's going to be pretty, pretty rapid. And uh, there's an interesting thing that I discovered talking to the publishers, is that the publishers are not so precious about DRM. There's actually, again, miscommunication. Most publishers think they have to use DRM to protect the, the agent and the authors. Well, then you talk to the authors and the agent and they say, well, but we don't really care because we want people to read our book. You know, at the end of the day, the number of sales that you make on an ebook is not really correlated to the level of piracy. Actually, it's directly correlated in a positive way. The more pirates you have, the more people buy the book. Because the people that pirate the book are people that would have not bought the book in the first place. But if they like the book, they may tell their friends. And so there is, you know, if you ask an author, would you rather be read by a million people with 100,000 buying the book, or would you rather be read by 50,000 people 
who opened the book, obviously you know what they're going to answer. Yeah, of course. Right. So yeah. again, the publisher thinking that they're using the DRM to protect the authors, but the authors, you know, thinking that the publisher are using it to protect themselves. So there is this miscommunication, which I think hopefully is going to be resolved very soon. In terms of timing, if you take the music industry, from the first big publishers dropping the DRM on iTunes in 2007, it took exactly 12 months for the big six to drop it. It took 10 years for music to go 50% digital. I think for ebooks, because the market is more developed, it will take probably five years. So we started two and a half, three years ago. I think it's going to be another couple of years before we reach 50%. At that point, I think we'll plateau because books are intrinsically more valuable than CDs and DVDs. Because unlike those discs, which are just carriers, you, know, you carry the media on it the book contains the reading technology within it. So when you spend five pounds on a book, you can actually get out of the shop and read it straight away. If you buy a DVD, you need to go and plug it in somewhere to consume it. So that's why I believe, you know, it's not, it's not the romantic thing about the smell of the paper and you know, that's all kind of probably for the older generations, but for the young people, the ability to just spend a few pounds and get a book and start reading it is gonna always make the book a more valuable medium than CDs and DVDs.